life to you I can shout from the inside out. Welcome to From the Inside Out with Pastor Tim Molter of Calvary Chapel, Fergus Falls in Minnesota. We're glad you could join us today. Sit tight, get your Bible, and get ready to get in the Word with us as we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book through the Word of God. Well, with that, let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 10, picking up in verse 27, going to the end of the chapter uh, 42. Uh, I was going to try and do all of chapter 10 in one shot, and I'm glad I didn't because uh, there's a lot here in chapter 10. And so, uh, title of our study today is Being a Disciple of Jesus. And so, we'll see Jesus teaches uh, that we need to be intentional in our desire to follow him, right? And to be a disciple of his. It's not an easy task, but it's worth it. It's far better than anything else this life has to offer. And so, Jesus is going to instruct us and his disciples on uh, the marks of a disciple, what does a true follower look like? And so my hope is that we'll be encouraged, we'll be strengthened as we take a look at this together. So with that, let's jump right in. And we'll pick up in verse 27. And uh, we'll go through verse 31. Jesus says, Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? Are not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. We'll pause there. Jesus talks about fear here and, and the fear that his followers would face. Uh, the number one uh, response you get from Christians on the reason that they don't share their faith, they don't tell others about Jesus, is fear. Right? Fearful of others' response, fearful of not knowing exactly what to say or how to answer their question, or fear of just looking foolish. And the word fear here in, in the, the Greek is phobia. Uh, it's where we get our English word phobia from. And so it's being scared, right? It's that, it's that mentality that you, you're kind of like paralyzed in fear, right? You don't do anything. You're kind of stuck. And so God knows that we're prone to fear. He has to remind us over and over again, do not fear. And... Um, and so we're not to fear Satan, right? The enemy has no power to destroy your soul. As bad as this world can get, the worst thing that could happen to us is persecution to the point of death. But God tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, to be absent from this body is to be present with our Lord, right? So if you're a Christian, this life here on earth even though as, as evil and as hard as things get in this life, this is the closest as a Christian you're ever going to experience to hell. But for those who aren't saved, those who don't know Christ, this experience here on earth is the closest reality they're going to ever experience to heaven. And so it's important that we realize uh, that God is the one who's in control. We want to make sure that we truly know him as Savior and Lord. So who should we fear? Jesus said you should fear the one who's able to take both your body and soul and cast into hell. That's the one you should be fearing. So people who are lost, people who don't know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, they should be fearful of, of hell. They should be fearful that there's going to be a day of judgment, a day of reckoning uh, for themselves. For thus who are saved, for those of us who put our faith, our trust in Jesus Christ, uh, the only one we have to fear is God himself. And the fear of God here is a reverence for him, right? It's a deep respect for God. It's bowing down before the king of the universe, recognizing who he is and all his majesty. He is a holy God. 
It's being awestruck by the power of God who created uh, the universe, right? The earth and the stars and everything. And how did he create it all? Spoke it into existence. The power of God and the power of his words. And then it's also a fear of God because it's knowing him, right? Having this loving relationship with him and not wanting to misrepresent him. Being fearful that I could somehow uh, cause damage to the reputation as a follower of Christ, right? Fearful that I would wander and that he's got to say, come on back, <laughs> this way, right? I want to stay as close as I can to Jesus, right? I want to be an ambassador for him. And so it's having that reverence, that, that godly fear, right, for him. And God cares for us more than we know. Jesus gives us an example here. Uh, and basically says, are not two sparrows sold in the marketplace for what we would say today is, is half a penny, half a cent. And yet not one of them shall fall to the ground without your father taking notes. If God has a detailed knowledge of the animals of this world and oversees their care, how much more you and I? God cares about us, right? And, and it's interesting, he, he talks about the, the hair's of our head being numbered. Uh, in verse 30, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Now, as some of us get older, maybe that gets a little easier. Uh, there's maybe a little easier for God to count those hairs on the head. Um, <laughs> but nonetheless, God knows even that, right? <laughs> Love you, brother. <laughs> uh, God still knows, right? He, he cares, right? If God can know those kind of details, we don't even know, right? How much more should we entrust our lives to him? And so we realize that God, God knows even those minute details about us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And we realize how concerned our father is for us. If we would only be aware of the tremendous concern he has, the tremendous care he has for us. Sometimes we feel like when we're going through a situation, God, where are you? He's right there. He's concerned. He, he cares for us, right? He wants us to seek him and, and seek his help. And so God has a tremendous concern for us. Our father has love for his children, and Jesus said, you're worth more than many sparrows. So if God takes care of the birds, how much more is he going to take care of you and me? How much more will our Father take note of us? So we really have nothing to fear. Not man, not the government, not any loss, uh, not war, and not even death, right? If we're in, in God's hands, we're taken care of, right? We want to continue to abide in Christ and be secure in the salvation he gives to us. So we can have confidence the truth of Jesus will prevail. We should go out and we should preach that gospel message with boldness to tell others about him. And I've learned over the years when I've uh, gone and shared Jesus with people, whether it's knocking on doors or being in a marketplace or just one-on-one -on -one with somebody, um, what I find it always draws me to do one thing very quickly. Realize my inadequacy, and it causes me to pray. Lord, I have no clue what I'm doing. <laughs> I need your help right now. I need you to fill me with your spirit. I need you to empower me. I need you to give me the words to say, bring back the scriptures to my mind that I've read. Um, but I pray that there would have a response to receive this. I pray there'd be fruitfulness from this conversation. Um, you begin to realize how much you're depending upon the Lord. And the reality is he does all the heavy lifting. We can't save anyone. We're just like uh, the paper boy. We're delivering the news, right? It's, it's the news about Jesus. He's the one that can, can touch their heart and, and open their eyes to see the truth and begin to reveal himself to them. And so we, we can realize that as we have the interaction with others, that conversation, we can begin to be bold for the Lord. Uh, David Guzek said, if the threat of persecution makes us draw back from speaking and preaching God's word, then in some measure, Satan has won a victory. His threat of persecution may not have succeeded in harming us, 
but in holding back the work of the word of God. And so the message of Jesus Christ is not just for a select few. It's for everyone, right? It's not to be hidden away, right? We're to let our little light shine for the Lord. And I'm sure if you thought back in your memory and you realized the person who told you about Jesus, I'm, I'm very, very confident that you are thankful that they took that opportunity to not be shy, but that they, they began to share Jesus with you, to tell you he loves you. He can forgive you of your sins. You can have a relationship with the creator of the universe. I'm sure you're very thankful that that person took that opportunity to have that conversation with you. They didn't shy away from it, right? And so we need not be afraid. We, we don't know the outcome uh, that can happen. My wife was reminding me of a story she heard the other day uh, from Lee Strobel. Um, he was working uh, in the newspaper industry as a journalist and had just come to faith in Jesus Christ after about two years um, and wrote The Case for Christ. And, and um, he uh, was uh, just about to leave work. I think he had, it was his last week being employed at the company. And uh, he was heading out to his car with a box of stuff, and he sensed the Holy Spirit tell him, you need to go back in and talk to your coworker about me. And he's like, ah, but he's an atheist, and he's even more, you know, off base than I was. And so he says, okay. So he goes back in, and he tells the guy, hey, I want you to come to, with me to church service. We're going to have an Easter service. And I, I know you, you're not, you don't want to hear anything about Jesus, but just do me a favor. Please come. Be open, right? I believe the Lord wants to share truth with you. And the guy's like, no, 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 I don't want anything to do with this. And so Lee Strobel left. He was just kind of discouraged. And he shared many, many years later, he had a guy come up to him and he said, do you know who I am? And he's like, I, I don't know who you are. I've never met you. He said, well, years and years ago, you would come into the office and you were talking to your coworker. And he didn't know it, but I was over in this area of the building. I was working on, I was part of the maintenance team at the time, and I was fixing something. And you were so patient with your coworker. I mean, I could just tell that there was something different about you. It was the love of the Lord. And, uh, and after that encounter, I thought, you know, where am I at with Christ? And so he said, I went home. I told my wife, uh, we're going to Easter service. We're going to go to this church. And he said, we got saved. And and we've been, we've been here this whole time. And, uh, and so Lee's like, okay, so maybe there was some fruit from that conversation. And so we never know from our conversations with people how they're going to respond. We may think, well, that didn't work out very well. Someone else could be eavesdropping, right? Or they may go and say, oh, that was a weird conversation. This guy really believes the Bible. And they may go, hmm, I wonder what else is in there. And they may read it and, and find Jesus Christ, right? And so we can't control how people around us will respond. We can only control how we will respond if we're going to be obedient to Christ. And maybe you think, well, what if they ask me a question I don't know the answer to? You just say, you know what? That's a really good question. I don't know the answer to it. Uh, what's your email address? What's your cell phone number? Let me get the answer, and I'll get it back to you as soon as I can. Then you're, then you're honest with them, right? We don't have to pretend we know it all. We know the, the answer is in the Bible. We know God knows it all. We can find that answer and get it back to them. And, uh, and so we want to make sure that we're doing what we can to point people to Jesus Christ. Charles Spurgeon said, There is no cure for the fear of man like the fear of God. If you know God, you can trust him because he does really care for you down to even the most minute detail. Again, if God cares for the birds, Right? If God cares for the sparrows, numbers the hairs of our head, he's going to pay careful attention to our needs. The God who knows us so well will take good care of us. So the emphasis on this, this short section here is clearly we do not need to be fearful. Right? We need to trust in our Lord. Well, next we'll see the implications of confessing Jesus is the Christ. We'll see that here in verse 32 and verse 33. Jesus says, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, 
Him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. We'll pause there. Now, years ago, I, I've read this many times, in, and for some reason, this last time it jogged my memory um, that I used to get these emails or on social media where it would say, hey, you're a Christian. You need to send this to 10 other people to show that you confess Jesus as Lord. Because if you don't, he's going to deny you before the Father in heaven. So don't, don't stop. You've got to send this to 10 people. And I always thought, why 10? <laughs> but if you get those kind of things, uh, you need to realize that's not what the text is saying here at all, right? If only it were that simple, right, to put something online and send it to 10 people, then I'm good to go, right? That's not the case here. The word for confess here uh, it means to agree with. You're agreeing with God that we're sinners, right? Our sin separates us from a holy God. The only way that we can be reconciled is by a sacrifice, by an offering. The only sufficient offering is what God has provided through Jesus Christ. Humbled himself, came to this earth, lived a perfect sinless life, voluntarily went to the cross to shed his blood, to die on that cross for you and for me, was truly buried, he was truly dead, rose from the grave. If we put our trust in Christ and the work, the finished work that he has done for us, we can be saved, right? That's what we're trusting in. That's what we're relying upon. That's what we're agreeing with, that God is good, God is always right, and he's always fair. So, we need to recognize that if, if we will not be public about our allegiance with Jesus, well, we cannot expect him to be public about us being in his family. The reality is there's really no such thing as a secret Christian, right? You're not a secret agent for Jesus, right? Uh, we're all public witnesses for Christ. And, and there's, there's no one who's a secret Christian, at least not in a permanent sense. I have heard many stories of our brothers and sisters being persecuted in North Korea, and you would think, well, they don't want to tell anyone about Jesus. But guess what? Many of them do. Because they realize the, the peace that God has given them, the joy that they have knowing my best life is yet to come, to be in paradise with my Savior, right? They, can, they don't want to keep it to themselves. They want to tell others, and they begin to share with their trusted friends and their trusted family. Right? And, and their hope is that others would experience what they've experienced. And so we want to have that same mindset. I think it was Warren Wiersbe who said that if you were arrested for the crime of following Jesus, would there be enough evidence to convict you? In other words, if you were arrested for being a disciple of Jesus, and you were tried in court, and they showed a video of your life, would there be enough evidence that they would realize that you're a follower of Jesus? Or would the charges be dismissed for a lack of evidence? Makes us think a little bit, doesn't it? Can people tell that I'm a follower of Christ? Or would they say, well, he just looks like everyone else? Right? Our hope is that we would look a little bit different. Right? Like the, like the guy that was eavesdropping or her Lee Strobel. Like, this guy's a little different. He's very patient with this guy. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't want to punch him. He wanted to, to love on this guy. Right? I hope people would see that about us. And so one day we must all stand before God, before the creator of the universe. And since we've confessed that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, is the Savior, is our Lord, our life is going to show it. Right? And the reality is one day when we're before the Father, our name's going to be called. We're going to step forth in front of the Father, and Jesus will step forth and say, Father, uh, this is Tim. Uh, I died for him. I paid his debt of sin. He is perfect. Now, you and I both know, maybe me more so, I am far from perfection. <laughs> uh, I, am, I am not perfect in any sense. But I know the power of my Redeemer. I know I've been washed by the blood of the Lamb. His Payment for my sins is sufficient. It covers all the wrong that I've done. And because of what Christ has done, because I'm in Christ and Christ is perfect, when I'm standing before the Father, he will declare me perfect. 
Jude one twenty four says, Now unto him who is able to keep you from failing and present you faultless for the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. So Jesus will present us before the Father. We'll be complete in him, faultless before the throne, dressed in his righteousness alone. Now, on the other hand, if a person has denied Jesus, they do not agree with what he's done. They do not agree that he is the Savior, the Messiah. Well, they're going to have to stand before God as well, and they'll be all alone. The books will be open. God, who knows the secrets and the intents behind our, our heart and our thoughts, they're all going to be written down. And those people that say, well, when I get to heaven, I hope God judges me by my works. Well, guess what? He will. Even all the motivation behind those things. And they're going to be laid before him. And suppose that person says, hey, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this? Didn't I do that? God's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. You see, there was no relationship. There was no connection with God. So we see the implications of confessing Jesus as the Christ, agreeing with God, knowing him. It's not just enough to know intellectually about who God is, right? We have to have a relationship with him. And I think sadly, many people are going to miss heaven uh, by about eight or nine inches, right? It's, it's the distance from their head to their heart. They can know all about him up here, but they haven't received him down here. They're not fully surrendered, not fully trusting in him. And so we need to realize our need for Christ, the salvation he offers for our sins, and that Jesus is the solution through the cross and the resurrection. And so the gospel message should change our lives, right? And if it doesn't, then people will reject and not agree. They will not confess what Christ has told us. And next, we'll see not everyone's going to accept the truth about Jesus. And we'll see that here in verse 34 through verse 39. Jesus says, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. We'll pause there. Jesus tells us he did not come to bring peace on the earth. That would be world peace. To end all war and all evil. That's not what his first coming was about. And you would think, wait, what? I thought Jesus did bring peace. Right? Well, he says he brings a sword. Right? There would be division. And so the message of Jesus Christ, yes, there is peace. We saw this in the Sermon on the Mount. Right? That there is a peace that God gives us. A peace we have with him. But it calls us to this radical commitment to follow him. Right? And because of that, because of this message of peace, it's going to divide between those who choose it, those who confess Christ, and those who do not, those who reject him. So the divisions between those two choices. And Jesus explains, he did not come to bring peace, but, but to bring that sword, to bring the truth. And so the gospel of Jesus, it unites people. Right? If you take a look at the, the disciples that Jesus had gathered, uh, I mean, they were, they were a very strange group. It's not very likely that they would have hung out outside of being called to follow Jesus. You had a tax collector, which was very much despised by the Jewish people, viewed as a, a traitor, an outcast. Um, you had Simon the Zealot, who uh, was radical and wanting to uh, rise up and, and take arms to uh, get Rome out. Um, and then you had fishermen, right? Uh, they were just ordinary guys. 
out on the boats, fishing, making a, a living, making uh, a profit so they can provide for their family. And God calls them to follow him. And so there's unity that we have in Christ. And I would venture to say probably if, if it wasn't for Christ, many of us wouldn't get to know each other either, right? Different walks of life. But it's Christ that draws us together and makes us a family. And so it's, it's the message of Jesus. But that gospel of Jesus Christ also divides men, right? And so there's two categories. Those who are part of the kingdom of God, walking in the light, and those who do not. Those who are in the kingdom of darkness. And the reality is you need to realize that there's no middle ground, right? There's no fence. You'll hear people say, well, I'm on the fence about God. There is no fence. In fact, if there is, the devil owns the fence, and uh, I've heard people say, well, I, I'm, I'm, when I die, I'm just going to go to purgatory. I have read my Bible many times. I, I have yet to find the word purgatory or any mention of this middle ground kind of place in any of the scripture. There is no. There's, there's a heaven, there's a hell. There's either going to be accepting what God has done or you reject what God has done. You're either in the kingdom of light or you're in the kingdom of darkness. And so we want to make sure we're following Jesus Christ. This is the dividing line between those who accept Christ and those who reject him. And he tells us he will even cut through families. And maybe you've seen this where a child comes to faith in Christ and the dad is resistant and rejecting and wants nothing to do with that. It brings division. It brings tension, right, in that family dynamic, in that relationship. And so we need to realize that. Uh, there's division that comes. There's a difference that comes. And I think living in a, in a nation that was founded on uh, Judeo-Christian values, we are very blessed here. Right? We have many rights, many freedoms as Americans uh, that other nations simply do not have. Other nations which are atheist or, for honest, communistic in nature, um, the, these, these communistic uh, countries persecute those who are in opposition to them. Many times they put them in labor camps or put them in jail or um, they put them to death. And then there's Muslim and Hindu countries. They attack and they imprison Christians as well. Um, and yet we realize we're living in a country that we, we have freedoms. And so we, we should be very thankful for that. Take advantage of those rights and those freedoms to tell others about Jesus, right? We should, we should take those opportunities that God has given to us. Well, Jesus also says here, our love for him should be the first and foremost, even above those of our family. You see, the greatest threat to uh, our love for Lord, our Lord uh, is in the form of idolatry. And, and idolatry is not always something that's so evil, right? It's usually what is second best. It's those things that get in the way of our love for the Lord. And uh, I've seen this uh, in, in many times when I did youth ministry in California where a gal would, would well, I'm, I'm dating so-and-so and we're so in love and we're going to get married and he's, he's my world. And, and then two weeks later, he dumped me and I don't know what I'm going to do. And mascara's running and, you know, where is God in all this? And I'm thinking, well, God's still here. He cares about you. But maybe this is a wake-up call. That, that you've put someone in the place, the position that God's supposed to have in your heart, right? Because if you seek the Lord first, he'll bring the right person, right? And hopefully that person's seeking the Lord as well, and he'll bring you together. But we need to realize that, that the Lord needs to be first and foremost, given our family relationships. And so we need to realize that, that he needs to be uh, the number one priority in our lives, and we now, we also expect, right, following Jesus in time, it's going to make us better husbands and wives and fathers and mothers and sons and daughters. But our devotion to Jesus needs to be above the devotion to our household, right? We need to put him first and foremost in our lives, on the throne of our hearts. It's either all to Jesus I owe, or I'm going to serve an idol that cannot save my soul. So how much better to keep Jesus in that proper place in our heart, in our lives, to seek him? And Jesus tells us the attitude of a disciple. We must be equipped with this. 
mindset. He, and he furthermore says we're to take up our cross and follow him. Now, the ancient Romans, uh, their cross did not negotiate. Those crosses did not compromise. Um, they did not make deals. There was no looking back when you took up the cross in, in the Roman times. Your only hope was a resurrection of life by God. And so Jesus gives us this reminder that we're to pursue him above all else. Right? We're not to look back. We're to keep our eyes upon him. And then he gives us this, this kind of paradox here. He says, he who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. And this is kind of a paradox because the only way that we can find life is by losing our own life. By surrendering our life to God. Right? And realizing we're going to die unto ourselves. Our works, our good deeds, they're not enough. We can't make it to heaven on our own. And then we find Jesus is the only way. And we find in him life everlasting. Right? So we, we lose our own life for his sake. And then we find real life in him. Right? And he's got a better life than we would ever have. And we realize we find all that we need in Jesus Christ. So the resurrection life can only come after we take up our cross and follow Jesus. Well, uh, next we'll see uh, that even a small uh, gesture of compassion, even a small uh, way to, to bless someone is seen in the eyes of the Lord, and he will reward it. And we'll see that here in verse 40. Uh, through verse 42. He says, He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet, and the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man, and the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water, in the name of a disciple, Surely I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. Those who receive us for following Jesus or doing it as unto Jesus, even if they don't realize it. And if that role is reversed and someone who is following Jesus wants to help us to get the gospel message out, we should receive them, right? We should realize we're, we're heading in the same direction. Right. We're on the same team. We're, we're, we're worshiping Jesus. So we're representing the Lord. Right? We're doing things as unto the Lord, helping people and serving Christ. And uh, we're not to be looking for earthly rewards. Uh, as servants, uh, you've probably realized this, it's often a, a thankless role. right? Uh, but we realize our real reward is coming from the Lord. right? That's the one we want to serve. And so we want to be like Jesus. We should be welcoming. We should be helpful to others. One of the things that continually runs through my mind is if the Lord were to remove Calvary Chapel at Fergus Falls from this area, would anyone notice? If, the, if all of us were just gone from this community, would anyone wake up and say, hey, what happened to those people? Or would we just vanish and life would continue on? That runs through my mind because my hope is that we are making a difference. And I believe we are, right? One person at a time. That we're impacting people for, for the gospel, for, for the Lord. And, and that through our, our daily interactions, we're helping people. We're encouraging people. We're praying for people. Uh, that people realize, right? That, that God loves them. That God cares for them. And so my hope is that we continue to be a blessing in this community for Christ. That we continue to help people connect with Jesus, right? And then grow in their faith with him. And as a church, we're committed to loving everyone, right? There are a lot of broken people in this community. So we want to extend grace to them. We want to help them. Uh, we want the Lord to change their heart, to change their life. We want to help people grow in their faith. Right? And if you've been here part of Calvary, you know, the primary way we do that is through teaching the Bible. Verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. 
right? And you've heard me many times encourage you uh, to make a habit of reading your Bible, right? To get into God's Word. And uh, when you have someone who's a new believer, encourage them to begin reading the Scriptures, right? To dig into, the, into God's Word for themselves. Gospel of John's a great place to start. And so, uh, no matter where people are on their, their spiritual journey, we want them to be able to be welcomed, right? We want them to connect with Christ and grow in the Lord, and Jesus says here that we can share in the reward of God's servants by even seemingly small works of kindness, such as providing them with water, a cup of cold water, or maybe you would say uh, bottled water, right? We may think nothing of it, right? I'm just trying to be helpful. And God sees that and says, I'm going to reward you for that. And I think there are many things that we get to have and we think, well, obviously I'm going to get a reward for this, this, and this. And God's like, no, no, you got your reward down there. People saw it. And there's going to be many things. The Lord says, oh, but I'm going to reward you for this, this, and this. And you're going to think, I don't remember doing that at all. And he goes, exactly. Because you were doing it unto me, right? You were just serving me. And it just came supernaturally, right? It was part of the fruit of abiding in me, of just being helpful to those around you. And so we can realize that. Even such a small thing as, as water. And again, practically, you would think, well, they're going to get thirsty again, right? So uh, what's, what's, what's the significance here? But Jesus says, even such a small gesture is remembered and rewarded by him one day in heaven. And again, I want to say thank you to everyone who's helped with getting us ready to, to meet in our new building and those who help week after week and service after service with all the things that we do here. Um, Many of you are, are serving behind the scenes. Nobody else sees it. Nobody else knows it. But God sees it. God notices it. God knows your heart and wanting to honor him, to serve him. And, and God will reward those things someday. And I wouldn't even venture to say I, I am very confident that many of us do other things outside, right, in the community. Blessing neighbors, helping people. We don't want publicity, right? We're not seeking our, our picture in the paper, but God sees those things. He notices and he will reward us someday. Even if we're not looking for a reward, he will. And so we need to realize that um, God, God wants to bless us even when we make it to heaven. So many people of this world are looking for a reward from their earthly investments. When the stock market crashes or the value of the dollar goes down, People sometimes feel like all hope is lost because they were looking for those material things as their reward. Again, I'm not, I'm not against retirement. I'm, I'm not against any of those things. But if that's your focus, it can become an idol, right? And, and I think the best long-term investment is those things that carry into heaven, right? That's the longest-term investment, right? Uh, and the rewards that are promised by Jesus, they're for all time. And guess what? They never go down in value. Right? In fact, they could actually go up in value over time. For example, if you lead one person to Jesus Christ, how do you not know that that person is going to tell someone else and tell someone else and tell someone else? You think about it. Those 12 disciples, as they went out and shared the gospel, then there were 70 others, right? The day of Pentecost, then there were about 3,000. And they began to tell others and others and others. And eventually, someone told someone else, and they told the person that told you about Jesus. And now you get to tell others about Jesus, right? And so that little investment, man, over time, can be multiplied. And you may get to heaven, and you may meet all kinds of strangers and say, hey, I just want to thank you. And you're like, for what? Well, you told so-and-so about Jesus. And because of that, it led to my family and all these others receiving Christ. And so we may not know uh, the impact that we can have here for the Lord. And so I hope that encourages us a little bit uh, to keep our eyes on the Lord and, and to be bold in our faith. So in closing, we see Jesus teaches us about being a disciple, being all in and following him. Again, this is not an easy task. This, needs, this is where we need to rely upon the power of the Holy Spirit. And God promises to freely give that to us, to empower us when we ask. We receive it by faith. 
And, and, and knowing God, having peace with God, it's far better than anything else. Even if this world continues to head on the course it's heading and persecution arises in America, we need to realize life with Christ, man, it's better than anything else. He is worth it. And so my hope is we continue to follow him in the days ahead, that we continue to know, man, Lord, I'm looking forward to being with you forever in heaven someday. But until then, my time's not done here. Help me continue to, to point people to you, to, to plant seeds of the gospel message, to water the truth in people's lives. And Lord, if I get to be a part of it, to pray with people, to be part of the harvest, that they may receive you as Savior and Lord. Let's pray. God, we thank you for knowing us. We thank you for loving us. Lord, we thank you that even you know the number of hairs we have in our head. We pray, God, that we would realize how awesome you are, that we would have a godly fear, a reverence, a deep respect for you, a love for you, Lord, that we would fully trust you with our lives. We ask, God, that we would be all in and following you, we would not be on the fence about things, Lord, but we would be fully committed to you, pursuing you above all else, that you would be number one in our life, on the throne of our heart, the one that we're serving, the one that we're following, the one that we're representing. And Lord, we know in order to do that well, we need to know your word, and we need to rely upon the power of the Holy Spirit. So God, we ask that you'd fill each of us afresh with the Holy Spirit right now. Empower us to be your ambassadors, to share the good news with those around us. And Lord, we pray this morning, if there would be anyone here among us who has yet to surrender their life to you, yet to make that decision of faith, Lord, that today would be that day of salvation. And if you're here and you say, Pastor Tim, pray for me, pray with me, I need to get right with God. I'm not certain that if I died today, I'd be with him in heaven. I don't want to be judged by my works. I don't want to be clothed in, I want to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And if you're here and you realize that Jesus loves you, he died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose from the grave, and you're ready to receive him as Savior and Lord, I want to encourage you to make that decision today. I'm simply going to lead you in a prayer, and I want to encourage you to repeat this after me and truly mean it in your heart. And so if that's you and you're ready to do that, I want to encourage you to truly mean this prayer from the bottom of your heart. God, I thank you for knowing me. I thank you for loving me. And I realize that you care about me. And God, I see that my sin has separated me from you. But that Jesus, you came to solve that problem. That Jesus, you died on the cross for my sins. That you were buried and rose from the dead. And God asks that you forgive me of all my sins. I surrender all of my life to you. Help me from this day forward to follow you. Put your spirit within me that I may do your will. God, I thank you for loving me. I thank you for forgiving me. I thank you for adopting me into your family. And I thank you for being my Savior and my Lord, my friend and my King. And I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Look, if that was you and that was the first time you prayed to receive Christ as Savior and Lord, or perhaps you've been a prodigal and a rededication, I'd love to encourage you after service, pray with you, give you some resources, give you a Bible if you don't have one. You've been listening to From the Inside Out with Pastor Tim Moulter of Calvary Chapel, Fergus Falls in Minnesota. We're glad you could join us today as we study God's Word cover to cover. Verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book. Would you like to partner with us? Consider becoming a giver with us to support this ministry. Please visit ccfergusfalls.com giving. Find out more about this ministry and all of our ministries 
check out ccfergusfalls.com. May God bless you as you study his word with us and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Life to you I give shout from the inside out.